Bombs away, I guess. Uh, many thanks to the wonderful people here at Oxford for inviting me to speak with all of you today. I have to get something off of my chest right from the start. I've had a bit of a crush lately on a certain former British Prime Minister. No, no, not Margaret Thatcher <laughs> or, or Tony Blair. Uh, though David Cameron, uh, he did have some of that 007 quality, uh, I suppose. Uh, but no, no, as you might have guessed, I am referring to Sir Winston Churchill. Uh, I suppose it's a little cliche for Americans to come to Oxford, don't roll your eyes, and start talking about Churchill, uh, so I'll keep that uh, to a bare minimum. But I recently stumbled upon a quote of his as I've been reading a lot of Churchill lately, and it appeared in an article he had written in Collier's Magazine in 1936, before he became Prime Minister. He was extolling the virtues of the U.S. Constitution, which is why I I wanted to mention it. Churchill wrote, I judge the civilization of any community by simple tests. What is the degree of freedom possessed by the citizen or subject? Can he think, speak, and act freely under well-established, well-known laws? Can he criticize the executive government? Can he sue the state if it has infringed his rights? Are there also great processes for changing the law to meet new conditions? Simple tests, Churchill wrote, simple tests. I especially like the part where he asks, can he criticize the executive government? Can he sue the state if it has infringed his rights? That one has come in handy as of late. <laughs> you may have heard about this on your side of the pond, but my employer and I recently put one of Churchill's questions to the test when we sued the Trump administration after the White House took away my press pass. Following a rather eventful news conference, last November after our midterm elections. The president, as you may have noticed, did not like my questions about his false claim that a caravan of migrants making its way to the U.S. border from Central America amounted to an invasion. As we all now know, there was no invasion. San Diego and the rest of California are still part of the United States. It did not become the colony of New Guatemala. Now, the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, lied to the world when she stated that the suspension of my press pass, or hard pass as we call it in the White House press corps, was necessary because I had placed my hands on an intern who came for my microphone when the president was finished hearing from me. That never happened. You can see in the video, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, that I did no such thing. But you may also remember that Sanders tried to bolster her case by tweeting out a doctored version of the video from one of the president's go-to websites, InfoWars, which is known for spreading wild conspiracy theories. That video, as you may recall, because I'm sure you saw it, had been sped up and altered to create the impression that I had karate chopped <laughs> the intern. Now, first of all, I don't know karate. Karate chops, I don't know. Pork chops, I do know. <laughs> but karate chops, not so much. But then folks had a chance to see the video for themselves, and when you looked at both the doctored video uh, and the unedited version uh, clip, uh, the vast majority of people, fortunately, could plainly see the only thing that was under assault that day was the truth. Yet the White House was asking the public to see its version of reality an alternate reality, kind of like alternative facts. The Trump-appointed judge hearing our case in federal court was not buying it. During his decision in favor of CNN, and thankfully resulting in the restoration of my hard pass, one of the more interesting things that the judge had to say was when he weighed in on that karate chop video. The judge described it as being of, quote, questionable accuracy. That from a Trump-appointed judge about something tweeted out by the White House press secretary. Now, the rest of that day went really well for me. I got my press pass back and returned to work. Uh, the following week, the White House dropped the whole thing, as you might have seen in the news, uh, and I went back to business. Uh, we, we seem to have moved on. It's not kumbaya, I'll tell you that, uh, by any stretch, but I can report to you and, and Mr. Churchill, wherever you are, uh, that the Constitution of the United States is still in pretty good shape. At least in my case, I think we passed one of Sir Winston's tests. 
But make no mistake, the institutions that have kept America strong are being tested in ways we haven't seen in my lifetime. And there is no tip, there's no point in tiptoeing through the tulips on this. On the subject of the special counsel's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election, Trump goes after our independent system of justice. He calls Robert Mueller's investigation a witch hunt. Despite a string of indictments of his former top aides and associates, he's even engaged in what some in our country believe to be witness tampering, with veiled threats aimed at his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen. I'm sure you've seen all of that in the news as well. Uh, but there is another threat that I've come to, to talk about uh, today, and it's not just uh, on, on our collective sense of reality and the truth. Uh, Trump is attacking, and I, and I know you've seen this, the free press in America with the kind of language we have never really witnessed in my lifetime. We have never really seen the President of the United States attack the free, free press with the kind of language uh, like calling us fake news or the enemy of the people. Uh, as we've all seen, these attacks come in the form of tweets that are sent out to his millions of Twitter followers. Now, we at CNN and in the White House press corps have tried to warn the president and his team that this kind of language can be dangerous, but our appeals for decency have fallen on deaf ears. Trump is not going to stop calling us the enemy, I'm afraid, until somebody gets hurt. And who knows after that? Let me take you back to last fall when I was at a Trump rally in Montana before the midterm elections. At the rally, the president praised that state's congressman, a man named Greg Gianforte, whose claim to fame is that he once body slammed a journalist named Ben Jacobs, a friend of mine who works for the Guardian newspaper. You've heard of that publication. Trump whipped that crowd into a frenzy when he declared that Gianforte was his kind of guy. The crowd went wild. I was right there. Uh, they cheered and they laughed. And as I looked over to one group of young men, and they were barely older than teenagers, one of them looked back at me and started making body slam gestures. And then he ran his thumb across his neck, like he wanted to slit my throat. All of his buddies at the time were cheering and laughing. This is not the first time I've felt threatened at these rallies. As you've probably seen, there are a number of YouTube videos out there of people directing the worst kinds of insults at me and my colleagues in the press corps. Uh, fortunately, we're protected by what we lovingly refer to as the press cage, uh, but basically these are just bike racks uh, that are tied up together around our filing area for our protection. At these rallies, I'm sure you've seen, the crowds have chanted, CNN sucks, or go home Jim. Uh, we've been called scum, traitors, and worse. The atmosphere is so intense and volatile, we often have to race back to our vehicles at the end of these rallies, uh, but yes, uh, we continue to hear the insults even as we are trying to make it back into our vehicles quickly. Uh, now, I, I, I'm sure you're wondering, as th this must happen all the time in the United States, this is, you know, this is par for the course. Um, I will tell you, I've covered four presidential elections. This is my second administration covering the White House, and this has not happened before. As I've stated to a number of folks when asked about these Trump rallies, it doesn't feel like I'm in America anymore. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but in my view, you don't treat your fellow Americans like that, and you don't treat your fellow human beings like that either. Uh, but we in the Trump press corps got a sneak preview of this behavior during the campaign. Trump would call us the dishonest media, the disgusting media, liars, scum, criminals, and more. The crowds would go wild. That's because so many people at these rallies were enthusiastic consumers of this kind of rhetoric. I remember seeing t-shirts at some of these Trump rallies that said, rope, tree, journalist, some assembly required. This verbal abuse, this threatening rhetoric, this climate of fear for the press in America continues to this day. And what is the effect around the world? Now there are other leaders in other countries referring to stories that they don't like as fake news. Autocratic governments suddenly feel emboldened to crack down on journalists sometimes in violent ways. There is no event I can remember that captured that threat to journalists today more than the case of Cesar Sayoc, the Trump supporter who sent pipe bombs to CNN and various Democratic officials just before the midterms last fall. I'm sure you saw that as well. Before his arrest, Sayoc made a number of threats directed at me, which I didn't realize until after he was captured in that white van covered in anti-media signage. 
As the president of CNN said in a statement about the attempted bombing of our headquarters in New York at that time, the president's words matter. This toxin that has been injected into our political discourse appears to be spreading day by day. Much of the bullying and intimidation, and I was telling some of the folks here about this before I got started, has filtered down into social media. Uh, social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. These platforms have become kind of a new frontier in efforts to harass members of the press. The deluge of comments flooding into my various social media accounts on a daily basis is truly disturbing. I won't share those comments with you here, but they range from insulting remarks about my colleagues and me to outright threats of violence. Last summer, I asked the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, you might remember this one, whether she agreed with the president's line of attack that we are the enemy of the people. As you may remember, she refused to disagree with the president. She instead pointed to the verbal abuse she has received, and that's regrettable, and moved on to the next question. That was not good enough for me, so I got up out of my chair and I walked out of the briefing. Perhaps they won't stop calling us the enemy of the people because it works so well with their people. But all of this adds up to one painful reality. This is a dangerous time to tell the truth in America. But make no mistake, the journalists at CNN and our colleagues in the press and other news outlets are not going to be bullied and we are not going to be terrorized. Yet, as was the case with that karate chop video, uh, the truth has been under assault over the last few years. Our collective sense of reality, our sense of the truth is being warped. The facts are under attack. Now, you might remember this person, or you might be too young, but you've heard of him. The late U.S. Senator Pat Moynihan used to say, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Sadly, times have changed. Now people feel entitled to have their own alternative facts. I think that's part of the problem the press faces today with some of the president's supporters, because Trump tells so many falsehoods and, yes, outright lies. We in the press spend much of our time and energy fact-checking him. That, I'm sure, creates the impression that we are always giving him a hard time when we are really just trying to set the record straight. A new kind of president requires a new kind of playbook for journalists. This doesn't sit well with the president. You may have heard him call me fake news, and he's called me that a few times. It doesn't bother me. Here's why. Let me take you back to that news conference in January of 2017. This was before he was sworn into office. The incoming president uh, was attacking our news organization, and I was trying to ask a question, but he wouldn't allow it. We went back and forth. I said, you're attacking our news organization. Allow me to ask a question. He said, no, you're terrible. You're fake news. But the question I wanted to ask was simple. Did your aides or associates have any contacts with the Russians during the campaign? What do we know today? A lot more than what we knew back then. We now know that at least one top official from the president's campaign, as well as his own family members, had met with people who identified themselves as Russian operatives in the summer of 2016. The special counsel is trying to sort out whether any crimes were committed uh, when it comes to this question of collusion, but some of the president's top people, his former campaign chairman, his former national security advisor, his former personal attorney, and his longtime advisor that we saw on the news, Roger Stone, doing the, the Nixon salute, have all pleaded guilty or have been accused of crimes in, in court. As it turns out, that question I wanted to ask was not fake news. But I've picked up on something covering this president each time he calls us fake news. We were on to something, something called the truth. Now imagine the alternative. Imagine what life would be like if the only trusted news source were the government, mandating what's reported and controlling what's deemed to be the truth. I have visited places like that. They are not the United States of America. They are not the United Kingdom. Consider the case of Jamal Khashoggi the Saudi journalist who was living in the U.S. and was killed by Saudi operatives in a consulate in Turkey. Remember what the Saudi government initially said, that he walked out of that consulate. The kingdom then changed its story and told the president of the United States rogue killers were to blame. Remember when the president re repeated that to us, rogue killers, as if O.J. Simpson were writing these press releases. <laughs> I was hoping that wasn't too dated a reference. I guess it was not. <laughs> And then the Saudis said it was a fistfight that had gotten out of control. Seems like their stories were getting out of control. 
A fist fight that ended with Khashoggi's body being dismembered? That's an example of the government, the Saudi government, lying to the people and creating its own version of the truth. But we can't control that, right? And Saudi Arabia, the kingdom, decides what the truth is, but we can control it outside of the kingdom. In the US and in places like Britain, which share our commitment to democratic principles, we can still ask the hard questions. Right after I got my credentials back, I, I pressed the president on his decision to side with the Saudis in the matter. You might remember you saw that in the news. He basically sided with the Saudis. I asked the president whether he was letting the Saudis get away with murder. I can still do that in the United States. Now imagine if the U US or the UK were under the same kind of repressive press restrictions that they have in Saudi Arabia. What would the US government tell us to believe? That Barack Obama wasn't born in the US? That Donald Trump did have the biggest inauguration crowd in the history of the world? <laughs> and that's the message I wanna pass on to you this evening. The fight for the truth is on. As corny as that sounds, the fight for the truth is on. And there is something we can all do. As journalists and as citizens, we must take a stand, not against the president, not against any leader for that matter, but a stand for the truth. There were some folks upstairs earlier saying, telling me nothing matters. Well, the truth matters. We must tell the truth and refuse to be afraid. As Sir Winston once said, we must never give in. We must never surrender. Our founding fathers in America talked about something called self-evident truths. They are the truths that are evident to all of us. You can use your own eyes and ears, your own mind to determine for yourselves what the truth is, what is right and wrong, what is real and what is fake. Let, let, us, let us do this. Let us figure out for ourselves just who exactly are the real enemies of the people. When it comes to that critical question, I believe, the truth is worth the fight. Thank you very much. So we're just going to begin with some questions with me, and then sure. later on I'll open it up to some questions from the audience, so everyone please be ready for that. But um, to begin with, I just wanted to ask, it's a real question whether there's any value to engaging with President Trump's media representatives, given their track record of lying, avoiding questions, and disparaging journalists. So I wanted to ask, what's the point of attending and covering the White House press briefings? Uh, that is a great question. Um, and, and people have said on Twitter, say, you shouldn't go to those things anymore. You guys should walk out and protest. Don't, don't, don't do the press briefings. Um, I am still of the belief that the press briefings are, are very important, and, and here's why. Sometimes the non-answers are more important than the answers. Sometimes the lies, when captured on video, um, are, are important for the public to see. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought that the, the briefings sort of proved their value in the first year of the Trump presidency when, you might remember this, Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, decided all of a sudden we're gonna have audio only briefings. They'd, we turned the cameras off and there was one briefing where I said, okay, Sean, what's the deal? The cameras are in the room. You know, the briefing room is wired for sound and cameras and lighting and so on. Turn them on, let's turn these on. There's, there's not a city council or, or a, a gubernatorial meeting or press conference where the, the, the press would go along with this, these restrictions. Why in the White House are we going along with this? And we did it for a little while and I think the, even the White House realized that they were now, they were like creating even more interest in the briefings because if they were, you know, um, if there was nothing to be afraid of, if there was nothing to worry about, why are they turning off the cameras, you know, and so on. Um, and so I do think the briefings are important. I do understand the point that, um, yes, when they get up there, you know, they're, they're engaging in alternative facts and so on, but that's okay. I, I, I want all of that on video and on audio and recorded for the record with the stenographer typing these things up and, and so on, uh, because I, you know, it's important that uh, our leaders be held accountable. And it's one of the, it's one of the things that we have in the United States um, that, uh, that maybe they, you don't see as much around the world. And I'd hate to see that tradition come to an end. So when you're asking questions, are you approaching it like a prosecutor trying to you know, catch them out and telling a lie and then following up on it later? 
Well, we, we get accused of that. You know, you're just going in there and asking gotcha questions to create YouTube moments and so on. But I mean, like I was saying earlier, part of, part of what we're doing in these briefings is, you know, we're asking about tweets. You know, we're asking about uh, outlandish things that the president has said. Uh, for example, when he said Barack Obama wiretapped me at Trump Tower, you know, he tapped my phones at Trump Tower and so on, which was a lie. And they ended up admitting at one point that, that he didn't do that, that they were just talking about overall surveillance. Well, over the course of, of a couple of weeks, we were, going, we were going back and forth with the press secretary over all of this. Um, and so, you, you know, I understand this, this accusation that you're trying to ask a gotcha question because you, you want to make a name for yourself and everything. But if we're not asking pointed questions, my attitude is, is that the public at home is like, wait a minute, you're not, you know, I can just almost hear their voices in my head saying, you're not asking that question, they're lying, you need to, you know, push back on that. And so we're sort of caught in a, in a catch-22. There are a lot of conservative Republican folks out there because there's a Republican in the White House um, who, who has got a lot of people very emotionally invested in him uh, who think that, uh, that I'm just out to get him and that we in the press are just out to get him. But my goodness, if you're going to lie on a daily basis or tell falsehoods on Twitter on a daily basis, I think the least we can do is try to get to the bottom of that and try to get to the truth. You call them pointed questions, but the way that you in particular, as opposed to the other White House correspondents, ask yeah. questions is in a very you know, policy-oriented way where your viewpoint is very much injected into the question. Mm. How did you decide that that was how you were going to ask questions? Well, I never go in there and just offer my point of view. Um, just to quarrel a little bit with the premise of your question, I, I mean, I, CNN would get rid of me if I were to get out there every day and say, the climate change agreement, the Paris climate change agreement is the most uh, important climate change agreement of all time, and the president is t a terrible person for trying to get rid of that. Like, I can't go on CNN and do that. Um, but we can ask very pointed questions about the wisdom of uh, withdrawing from a multilateral climate change agreement that is about arguably, you know, the most important challenge facing the planet. I mean, you can, I think, do that. Now, somebody who's sitting back and watching that might say, well, he's just asking that question because he's one of these nutty environmentalists or something like that. I can't, I can't uh, get wrapped up in that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the one press conference where I felt like I did bring a bit of myself uh, to the table um, uh, was a press briefing with Stephen Miller, who you may have heard of, the domestic policy advisor and speechwriter. Uh, and this is when he and I got into it over immigration. And we had gone through this whole briefing and he wasn't calling on me because they typically do that to me. They try to make me wait until the end because they, they think if I'm put in timeout, I'll behave better and so on. <laughs> Which is wrong, it's the wrong way to go. <laughs> Just makes me come up with more creative questions. And I, at the end of this, I'm thinking to myself, because he was talking about at the time in this, in this briefing that they wanted to cut immigration to the United States, legal immigration, not illegal, legal immigration, by 50%. And I thought to myself, well, you know, my father is a Cuban immigrant. He's a refugee, came to this country right before the Cuban Missile Crisis, fled a communist country. You know, the tradition of the United States has always been like the Statue of Liberty, bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to bring, breathe free. And so I asked Stephen Miller about the Statue of Liberty, we ended up getting into this whole debate about immigration and what it means to be um, American and, and, and so on. And at one point, um, he said to me, well, that, that poem that you're reciting, that was added to the Statue of Liberty later. The Statue of Liberty is not really about immigration, it's about liberty in the world. And so on. I was like, wait a minute, what are, what are all those pictures that I've been seeing my whole life in the history books of all of these immigrants coming from the old world uh, and immigrating to the United States in search of a better life. I thought that was also the tradition of the United States. That's how I was raised. Um, and I, I accused him of doing some national park revisionism, uh, which he didn't like very much. Um, but I do think that you can't divorce yourself from who you are and, and what you grew up with, especially if they were like history books with facts in them. You know, that also should be, I should be able to bring that to the table without being accused of of being the enemy of the people. Um, and so I, I do think that it's, it's credible and, and, and relevant to some extent. I, can, I could not go in there and, and say, the GOP tax plan is a giveaway to the rich, you're terrible. Like, I can't do that. That would, that would be irresponsible. That would be me injecting my opinions into what should be straight news reporting. But I can challenge them on things like, you know, the American tradition of welcoming immigrants in the United States and the fact that we, you know, it, it is not normal for a president of the United States to refer to Mexican immigrants in the U.S. as rapists and criminals. I, I think that that is well within the realm of doing fair reporting. 
regardless of whether you inject your position into your questions, you do engage in a very kind of hostile attitude when you ask the questions. And based on that, people like Steve Bannon had said, you're the White House's favorite reporter, that you're yeah. playing exactly into their hands. Yeah. Do you think it's your responsibility to get away from that? I mean, I think you have to be tough. I, you know, when you're called the enemy of the people in fake news and they're going after your news organization and telling whoppers and lies all day long, I think the, there's a reasonable expectation that, that, that reporters are gonna be aggressive. And if the press secretary on the very first day of the administration, January 21st, 2017, comes into the, into the briefing room, accuses all of us of misreporting the president's crowd size and underreporting it intentionally and so on to make him look bad, you know, that is not exactly getting things off to a good start in terms of relations with the press. And I think right away, in that instance, Sean Spicer completely obliterated his credibility and set the table for some pretty hostile relations with the press. On, in addition to that, on that very same day, the President of the United States went to the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, stood in front of a memorial to fallen CIA officers and also attacked the press and called it a running war with the press. He called it a war with the press in those remarks and accused us of misreporting his inauguration crowd size, which, you know, why are we getting into crowd size? You know, what is that all about? But um, why is that so important? You know, why are we talking about this the first day of your administration and so on? Um, so I think it, you know, there are two sides to this. I mean, Steve Bannon can say that, that's fine. He can say, I'm their favorite reporter because I gin up their base and so on. But the thing I say, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, is what if we weren't being aggressive? What if we weren't getting a little pissed off when they're just flat out lying to us or, getting, or calling us names or getting their crowds of people to scream at us and so on? I mean, my God, are we just supposed to roll over? Are we just supposed to take it? And I have, you know, there are, I have these debates on the bar stool all the time with, with friends and colleagues. And, you know, there are folks who say, you should just take it. You should just absorb it. You should just be quiet. You shouldn't say anything. You're giving them more energy and, and you're feeding into this and so on. But okay, that's fine. You can have that opinion. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily argue with that, but I'm still thinking about the, the folks at home. I'm thinking about my own kids. Are we just supposed to let the bully beat us up on the playground every day, or are we supposed to do something about it? Now, I'm not getting up there and taking swings at the press secretary or something like that, but if they're gonna call, like you know, Sarah Sanders has said to me, you don't understand short sentences, and you know, <laughs> she said that at one briefing. She said, I know you don't understand short sentences, Jim. And, I've never said anything like that to her. I've never said, well, Sarah, you don't understand short sentences. You're not very smart. I mean, CNN would call me, you know, call me and be like, Jim, I think maybe you need like a week off or something. Um, I, so, you know, it's a little bit of a tilted playing field, right? Because they're the president, they're the press secretary, they're the White House. They can roll things downhill on us. And, you know, we are at a bit of a competitive disadvantage. I suppose it is not a, a level playing field. We're the press, they're, they're in the administration but I don't think we should just take it on the cheek, I, I, on, on the chin. I don't think we should turn the other cheek and take it on the chin. I think to some extent when the rhetoric gets to that level and the hostility gets to that level and we're getting into dangerous territory calling us the enemy of the people and that sort of thing, I think from their st standpoint, they have to have the reasonable expectation that there's gonna be some pushback. I completely agree. It's an incredibly difficult situation and I agree yeah. you can't just be passive and take it. Yeah. But when you are hostile, mm -hmm. the fact is that most Republicans are inclined to believe the president over, for instance, CNN. Yeah. So in an atmosphere where trust of the media is in such danger, how do you see your role in mending that trust? Well, I would love to see uh, their rhetoric brought to a reasonable level. Uh, I'm not going around calling the president the enemy of the people. I'm not going around. We in the press are not going around and making those kinds of those kinds of accusations. And I think if they were to lower uh, the rhetoric on their side, I think you would see the press follow suit. I don't think you're gonna see that happen because the president has come to the conclusion and his aides have come to the conclusion that fighting with us is good for them and beating us up is good for them. And then you could say, well, so then you shouldn't engage and you shouldn't fight back and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. But then we're sort of getting back to the uh, wagging the dog, the tail wagging the dog. I, you know, I, I think that the, and I've gamed this out and I've played what would you do in my head over and over with this sort of thing. To me, it's not about what emboldens their behavior or curbs their behavior. To me is what is the message that we are sending to the United States of America, the people of this country, and what are we, what are we sending to the people around the world? 
Are we sending the message that it's okay for the president to beat us up and call us the enemy of the people or not? And that's basically it. And I'm not, I'm not okay with it. And if, if at some point the folks that I work for say, hey, you know what, the, enough is enough, we don't wanna do this anymore, then that's fine. But, but my personal opinion, and it's a deep, deeply passionate, close to my heart opinion, is that it is a morally wrong thing to do to describe journalists as the enemy of the people. I think it creates an atmosphere where people could get hurt, where journalists could get murdered, and, as, and I've said this before, the day that you have a journalist murdered in the United States is the day that we become something less than the United States of America. Then we join a category of countries where reporters are, are being hurt um, and killed mainly because they just want to do their jobs. And I, you know, that, that is the reason why we've tried to go to the president privately, his people privately, and said, listen, you got to knock it off. You can't say this kind of stuff. Words matter. And it, even after we had a pipe bomb sent to our headquarters in New York, the president proceeded to call the press the enemy of the people. So, I mean, I can try to, you know, they can get rid of me, and I could try to ratchet things down a little bit and turn down the hostility level uh, 25% to a point where you personally might feel comfortable with what I'm doing. Is that going to stop the pre president from calling us the enemy of the people? Is that gonna stop, us from, stop him from engaging in that kind of rhetoric? Is that going to uh, lead to his people to stop sending us pipe bombs and coming after us at rallies and so on? I think at the end of the day, the answer to that question is, is very obviously no. And so to, to put the onus on us and to say it's, it's our responsibility solely to turn down the temperature, I just don't think that's dealing with reality. So the, the and I don't mean that, I don't mean to be hostile with you. I'm just saying oh, that. No, of course. <laughs> I appreciate that. I just, Thank uh, you. Know, I'm just telling you what's on, what's in my heart. Yeah, very I, pointed I, I do that. Yeah. Um, so the war is kind of with the media in general, but he does like to focus particularly on CNN, President Trump. Why do you, why do you think he picks on CNN especially? I don't know. I think I, I I've described this to people before. There, there is something called the CNN effect. We're, we're on all the time. And so, you know, if you're in a campaign office and you look up at the TV, it's like, oh my God, he's doing another live shot where he's talking about Mexicans are rapists and criminals and so on. Why won't they let that one go? And, you know, I saw this during the Obama administration when I covered the Obama White House. And you might remember this, uh, they, they passed the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the website was uh, put out there and the website didn't work. Remember when the uh, Obamacare website didn't work and people were going online and they're trying to sign up for healthcare and they couldn't get it to work. And we were doing live shots all day long and doing stories on it all day long. And I call it the CNN effect because they're back in the White House press office and they're looking at their TV screens and they're like, oh my God, Jim Acosta is once again doing a live shot about how the website doesn't work. And the press secretary called me, Jay Carney called me in the, in the uh, booth where we work. And he was like, Jim, you, got, you and Wolf are just out of control on this one. Can you guys cut us a break? And I'm like, what do you, I didn't build the website. I didn't, I didn't. I mean, Obama literally said it was going to work like Orbitz and, and, and uh, Expedia and all this stuff. I didn't say those things. You guys said it was going to work. We're just here to report when it doesn't work. Um, we're not here, as I've told Trump supporters at, at these rallies, we're not here to do a commercial for you guys. You know, we're here to do the news. And sometimes it, it, it's not pretty and you don't like what we have to say, but, you know, tough. You know, you get to be the president. You know, that's pretty good, too. You get a plane and a car and all this stuff, you know, you get some perks too. And I, my perk is I get to tell the truth and tell the public what's going on. And I don't have to put a bunch of political BS and spin on it, you know? I can just tell it like, I can, as I like to do, tell it like it is. And uh, people might think that I'm not, but um, you know, as I was saying to some students up there earlier, I haven't met an executive with a news outlet, an editor with a news outlet, a fellow journalist, reporter, producer, and so on who is just maniacally trying to spin things and twist the truth so we can get a certain agenda across. Every person I've ever worked with in my 25 years of doing this is just, they're just trying to do the news. And you know, there are some, some of us, there are some of them out there who, yes, they wanna be t big TV stars and they wanna be the big anchor on the Today Show someday. And yes, there are those motives. But, but I've never witnessed somebody who just wants to intentionally twist things to put across some agenda. I just haven't run across that. And so, and this goes back to what I was saying to uh, a young lady earlier upstairs, we have to get to a point in this world, not just in America, but in Britain and other uh, free societies, where we start trusting one another again, where we have a little bit of faith in our fellow human being. 
I mean, I, I, I like to give this analogy. You pull over, uh, if you, your car breaks down and you have to pull over on the side of the road, do you automatically assume that the person pulling up behind you to lend you a hand is an axe-wielding murderer who is just going to chop you up in pieces? Or is it possible that it might be like a re nice retired Marine, he might even be wearing a MAGA hat, and he's just going to help you get your car going again? Um, I, I do think with the Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all these social media apps that reinforce our opinions and put us in conflict with people that we don't agree with, that we've we've let ourselves to believe that the world is just hopping mad and out of control. Whereas I, I still, and I see this at Trump rallies too, because people come up to me and they just want to talk. There are still some really good, decent people out there, Trump supporters too. And you just have to have a little bit of faith that it's not all coming to an end, that there are still decent human beings out there who love the world, love other human beings just as much as you do. And, and, I, and I, that's maybe a little too philosophical, and now we're getting into is man you know, inherently evil or is man inherently good and so on. But I, I, I come squarely down on inherently good. I just, I, that's how I'm wired. I've always been that way. And we have to, I think we need an injection of some of that attitude in our politics and, and how we inform ourselves and consume the news. Just to circle back on what you said yeah. a second ago about the Obama administration. Yeah. Sometimes when you're accused of having a liberal bias, you respond that, no, I was equally adversarial with the Obama administration when I was you know, in the press briefings as well. I was. I, was, I mean, I, I thought I was. Go ahead. But do you think your approach has changed, or is it, is it the same? Well, there was, there was a time when Obama, and this used to be a frustration for us uh, under Obama, he, would, um, he was going around the press and, and doing things like uh, sitting down with YouTube stars. He, he did this one time where he did a... a round of interviews with YouTube stars, and there was a woman named Glozell. You might have seen her on YouTube. Um, she like took a bath and then Fruit Loops, you know, and with cereal and milk. You're, like she was known for these sorts of things, and all of a sudden she's sitting down and interviewing Obama about healthcare and so on. I'm like, wait a minute, how is it that this YouTube star is more qualified to interview Obama about healthcare reform than like reporters who cover this every day? And so during the news briefing with Josh Ernest, the press secretary at that time, I said, um, I said, Josh, was uh, Charlie bit my finger not available? Or uh, was David after dentist not available? And he was like, what are you talking about? He, he didn't get my jokes. And I don't know if those, are those YouTube references dated? Is that a thing now? <laughs> now there are d dated YouTube references. But at the time, those were totally cool at the time. Um, remember the kid that bit, bit the finger? Anyway. And Josh didn't like that. And then there was a press conference when ISIS was running all over Iraq and Syria. We were at a G20 summit in, Syria, in uh, Turkey. And I asked Obama, I said, well, the fact that we have the entire world behind us, we have the strongest military in the world, why can't we get these bastards? And I said it just like that. And his press people went crazy. They were so furious with me that I'd said bastard at a press conference. And, and I remember the Atlantic Magazine was traveling at the time with Obama on Air Force One. They didn't, you know, not me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's a story, this, this guy with the Atlantic wrote a story about it and, and talked about how I had asked this question at this press conference. And uh, Josh Ernest and uh, I guess the Deputy National Security Advisor at the time, Ben Rhodes, who handled a lot of the messaging, they were both making fun of my question to this reporter on Air Force One. And the reporter goes, yeah, but why can't we get these bastards? <laughs> Um, and so sometimes when you, you know, you, you call them hostile questions, I was raised by blue collar uh, parents, I, I sort of think of them as, as regular American questions, regular Joe questions, like the questions that just kind of get to the heart of the matter, like ISIS is running rampant across Iraq and Syria, why can't we get these bastards? Um, you know, President Trump, did you talk with the Russians during the campaign? Like, Everybody wants to know, like, is that what happened? Why can't we ask that question for Pete's sake? I mean, I, this whole notion that we should be afraid of asking like the most obvious pointed question to me is, is kind of mysterious. I, I don't know how we've gotten to that world, but we, we, def, we desperately need to get back to Earth One, as I like to call it. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions in just one minute, but I wanna ask one more question, sure. which is, after your press pass was revoked, there was a famous incident where CNN filed a lawsuit against the administration. Yeah. It looked like it was going to be a defining lawsuit about the First Amendment, the extent of it. But in the end, it was resolved on more procedural grounds. Yeah. Are, you, are you annoyed? Do you regret that you weren't able to have the full fight? 
as one of our lawyers said, it was a great day for the Fifth Amendment. Uh, yeah, no, that case, and if you go back and research the Cheryl case, which was from the 70s, I believe, where they took his press pass and they didn't give him due process, and that's the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution deals with due process, and the Trump-appointed Trump judge uh, basically decided that they hadn't given me my due process, and he put aside the First Amendment part of it, I think because it would have been a lot messier. Um, you know, I was, I was glad that it worked out my way, you know, one way or the other, it didn't matter. You know, whatever amendment you want to choose, as long as, as, long as I got my press pass back. Um, but I do think that had we continued to fight it, I do think it would have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And I, and I do believe, even though there's a conservative tilt to the court, um, I, I, I just firmly believe that the Supreme Court would not have ruled against a news outlet, um, you know, that was attempting to ask the President of the United States a question and they got so upset about it that they threw him out of the White House. I just, I refuse to believe that we've gotten to that point in this country where we wouldn't win the day on that one. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the really interesting things that came out in that case was, and this was me, I was sitting in the courtroom watching this unfold, the federal government, you know, we were suing the federal government, and so they were represented by lawyers for the United States Justice Department. And it was just sort of getting back to this notion of, you know, are we on Earth One, are we on Earth Two, and just how surreal things are. To sit in court, and Lauren was there with me, um, to listen to lawyers, taxpayer-funded lawyers for the United States Department of Justice arguing against a news organization trying to exercise their First Amendment rights of free press was sort of like this, you know, am I in the upside down, you know, uh, what's, what's going on here? And thankfully, at the end of the day, they, they weren't successful, but one of, the, um, one of the arguments that they made was, was that we in the press don't have a First Amendment right to be on the grounds of the White House. You know, they were, they were saying some things along those lines, you know, even though journalists have been working on the grounds of the White House for decades. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a good thing that we have checks and balances in the U.S. as you do here in the U.K., different system, of course, but you have the system of justice overseeing what the executive branch is doing in the U.S., um, and, and thank goodness that's the case. I, I would probably, well, maybe I would be talking to you guys tonight, but I wouldn't have my press pass with mm -hmm. me. Okay, we'll have some questions now. Um, I'll pick you. Just wait. A microphone will come your way. Um, just here, close to the front, near the aisle. A few months ago, Steve Bannon was invited to the Oxford Union, and protesters stood outside and uh, forcibly prevented people from coming in. So I'm curious about you as someone who's come here to talk about truth. I'm curious what you think about uh, that sort of more forceful, preventative sort of protest and whether that's uh, combative against the pursuit and uh, uh, expression of truth. Yeah, I, I am definitely not in favor of that. And, and uh, some of this gets blown out of proportion in conservative media, you know, uh, in academia, there's a war on conservatives and so on, and they're trying to censor us and that sort of thing. I'm like, that can get a little carried away. But there shouldn't be people, you know, trying to bar folks from getting in to listen to somebody like Steve Bannon. I mean, if, if that's how you want to spend your free time, um, <laughs> be my guest, you know. I know he wears multiple jackets and that's interesting and, and so on, or whatever it is that he does. Um, he's, a, he's kind of an interesting character, but... Um, you know, listen, I, 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 I think we have to be open to all points of view. And in the moment that you try to do something along those lines, I think you're feeding into what I was talking about earlier, which is like, my goodness, can we just have some faith in our fellow human beings? Like, let poor Steve come in here with his three jackets and his four shirts and tell us that Donald Trump is the greatest president of all time. I mean, why, why would you prevent him from doing that? Uh, it's sort of like, you know, why should we get rid of the press briefings? I love the press briefings. They should be on all the time. Let them come in there and explain what they're doing all the time. Um, because, you know, not only is it informative, um, I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, a lot of what they do sometimes can backfire. And so, you know, you don't want to get in, I mean, who, who am I to try to get in the way of people backfiring, uh, especially when they're in public office? Great. Uh, another question then. We'll go just the far one over here. Hi, so thank you so much for your interesting talk. But I'm curious uh, if you think that your, your network covers Trump too much and uh, obviously how to react to so many of his um, you know, provocative comments in a way that doesn't maybe give him too much attention but balances you know, your, your coverage of him. 
You trying to take away, take away my airtime? Is that it? Is that... <laughs> um, you know, listen, do we cover Trump too much? Yes. Um, can we control that? I don't know, because here's why. And I will point out, the other day, we did not carry uh, Sarah Sanders' uh, press briefing live. Uh, we, we stopped doing that the other day. I don't know if that's going to continue to be a trend, but um, we, um, we are covering something, as he would say, the likes of which, which is one of those weird phrases he uses, we haven't seen before. Um, we haven't had a president of the United States refer to the press as the enemy of the people. We have not had a president of the United States refer to immigrants as rapists and criminals. Um, we have not had a president of the United States engage in conspiracy theories like Barack Obama wiretapped me or I lost the popular vote because millions of people um, fraudulently voted. Um, you know, this is, this is sort of the conundrum in covering Trump because during the campaign, he would say all of these outlandish things and um, CNN was covering a lot of this stuff live. And it was, it generated so much interest in the public and we had so many people watching, it was sort of like, oh my God, look at that car crash on the side of the interstate, I can't stop watching this. Um, you know, there was, some, I think, some unhealthy viewing going on just because people wanted to see this, this spectacle. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we're trying to wrestle with right now. I know that um, our, our president at CNN, Jeff Zucker, said at Harvard, um, did we cover those rallies too much during the campaign? Probably so. Do I think you're going to see less of that during the 2020 campaign? Yes. But part of that is, you know, um, hindsight is 2020. We learn from what we did in the previous cycle, um, and we try to do it better the next time. Uh, we're not perfect. Um, you know, I, I, I think that th this is such a unique time, and it's such an important time because so much of what we're seeing right now is revealing who we are. You know, it's, it's revealing what has been sort of buried down deep uh, for a long time in the United States. There's a lot of racism. There's a lot of xenophobia. There's a lot of sexism. Um, a lot of that is getting dredged up right now. And, you know, and in some ways, I, I think it might be a healthy process. I think we might look back, um, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, and not necessarily see the Trump presidency as a healthy thing. I'm not, I'm not here to argue that. Um, but that we, we did search our souls uh, during this time period. And should we read every tweet on the air? Uh, probably not. Um, we spent a lot of time fact-checking those tweets live on the air. I'm like reading a tweet and I'm fact-checking it at the same time. Um, but because we've never had a president of the United States engage in this kind of behavior before, it's sort of a, a story that we can't, uh, avoid. Um, but at the same time, yes, I want to make sure that we're covering um, everything that's happening around the world. One of the things that we've been, we, we devoted a surprisingly uh, large amount of time to, and it's, it surprised me, and I remarked uh, to my colleagues about this, was the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, typically, a journalist, uh, the murder of a journalist would warrant coverage for, you know, three or four days, something like that. It went on for weeks, primarily because we were trying to hold the president's feet to the fire, the administration's feet to the fire, is what are you going to do? Are you going to go after the Saudis on this? Are you going to punish them? What's going to happen to the relationship? And it became this very interesting and important story about the Saudis and what's happening in Saudi Arabia and about press freedom around the world. And, you know, you saw on the cover of Time magazine, uh, the person of the year uh, were the guardians of the people, uh, journalists. And so, as we were talking about upstairs, uh, there's, a, there's a new healthier appreciation for journalists in part because of this rather odd uh, period that we're going through in the United States. And that is not an entirely unhealthy thing. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I just took a long time to answer your question. I don't know. Um, I do think we have to cover it as much as we're covering right now. We have to make space and time for other important stories too. I do think we're doing that maybe more than the public. I know there are critics on the left who are like, you do it too much, you criticize it, you're just getting, making money, you're making lots and lots of money, shame on you. Um, but it's, I, don't how, I don't see how we could avoid what's happening right now and avoid that story. Great, another question then. Um, how about there on the red? Hi, um, do you believe that Fox News, especially reporters such as Sean Hannity and Jeanine Perot, are actively harming America by simply repeating Trump's rhetoric? 
I, uh, I just want I, I, that's an excellent question, and I want to say, you know, Shepard Smith, who is one of the anchors at Fox News, uh, that day that Trump called me fake news, was one of the first people out of the gate uh, defending me and defending CNN. And uh, I'm, a, I'm enormously grateful to some of the folks over there who have tried to defend us at times. Um, but I, there is no doubt that there are forces, there are personalities on that network who act as propagandists for the President of the United States. And this gets to this other gentleman's question, which is how do we cover this? How much, do you, how much is too much? How much is the right amount? And so on. One of the interesting things that has occurred over the last few years is in the United States is we've seen, you know, sort of the, the infancy of a potential, you know, state TV in the United States of America in, in Fox and that, that network primarily um, serves as a, as a house organ for the administration and it's one of those painful, uncomfortable truths that we in the press don't want to get into too much because I mean, there are, I have friends over there. I don't want to, you know, hey, you're state TV and so on. That's like your fake news. You know, it's not a nice thing to do. But I do think we have to come to grips with the reality that, especially in the prime time hours of their programming, they are primarily just serving as propagandists for the administration. And they're spending a lot of time attacking people like me. I mean, Sean Hannity, you know, has run segments on his show, Acosta Unhinged, you know, and... Um, and Lauren knows this, I mean, and, and that night or the next day, he'll do a segment on me and I'll get 10 death threats in my social media accounts and the, the hostility will just be unleashed. And so there's no, there's no denying the fact that they command a, a massive audience in the United States, but this goes back to what the president was doing during the campaign and what he does now as president. When you push people's buttons and you push buttons that haven't been pushed in a very long time, in a free and democratic society like xenophobia, like racism, like sexism, and going after the press, going after the, the notion of an in, in, independent system of justice in the United States, you are going to unleash some dark forces, in my opinion. And those dark forces have, have been directed at me and my colleagues at CNN, no question about it. I mean, I, I, I can't stand up there and say, this is about the truth, and then sit down and be like, no, Fox, are, they're just fine. I, you know, I can't lie to you and say that this is all well and good. Um, th my sense of it is, is that they're going to, at some point, have to come to grips with this truth, and that is that as a responsible outlet, they can't keep going on like this. Now, having said that, they supported, you know, as a, as a news organization, they supported me, and they supported CNN, during our effort to get our, our press pass back. So it's sort of a, um, a beast with many heads over there. Um, and there are some good people there. And there are people who, you know, they come up to me and they say, Jim, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say, you guys keep doing what you're doing. Keep holding their feet to the fire. They'll, they'll DM me on Twitter privately and say, by the way, you're doing a great job over there. Um, I wish they could do it publicly, but I understand why they can't. And it gets back to the uniqueness and the seriousness of the time that we're experiencing back in the United States, which you guys over here have always thought of as, well, they're, they're supposed to be normal. This is supposed to be a functioning democracy. All of this is, why is all of this happening? Um, there, are, there are some really long, complicated reasons as to why all of this is happening. There's a lot of unfinished business. There's a, there are a lot of ghosts that haven't been laid to rest in the United States, and those are part of the reasons uh, why, why what we're seeing right now is happening. And until we take care of that unfinished business, you know, we're, we're gonna have you know, a difficult time to get through. But um, you know, I hope that you know, if people look at this video and they look at it online and so on, that they don't have this immediate takeaway that I came out here and I, and I bashed uh, the folks at Fox, because there are good people over there trying to do an honest day's work. And it's just, it, they've got a very complicated problem over there to sort out. That's my view on that. That's really interesting. Uh, another question then. Uh, in the front row over here. Hi. Um, this is kind of a generalization, but people talk about Americans and say that they don't know and they don't care. <laughs> and for They young, say what? They, they say we don't know? They just know. don't know Who doesn't about know? Americans. They don't know about politics. They don't know about what's going on. And uh, generally, a lot of people don't trust any media outlets, 
And so what do you recommend for young people that are like becoming politically aware at this time when it's like, oh, it's too late to ask? Uh, and, and what do I tell young people in terms of what they should consume in, in terms of information, like what news outlets they should go to and that sort of thing? Or well, like, How do you think young people that are surrounded by anti-media rhetoric should like, navigate becoming yeah. politically aware? That's a tough one because a lot of the, uh, you know, I'll be on my Instagram and it's, it's frightening and it's scary, but it's also very illuminating and interesting uh, in sort of an out-of-body experience kind of way. I feel like an anthropolo anthropologist a little bit. Um, when you know people leave these death threats or these negative and nasty messages on, on my Instagram and so on after I've done a report or Fox News has come after me or something like that, and I'll click on the accounts for some of these negative comments, and it's you know somebody who's just graduating from high school this year, or somebody who's you know uh, such and such college year tw you know graduating class year 22, and I'm thinking to myself, my God, this is a young person who is so upset with what they're seeing or what is being rammed into their head that they think it's okay to go threaten a journalist. And you know, sometimes it'll say, you know, God, country, family, you know, and under their, their name and their picture and so on. And um, no, it's, I mean, that's, that's really true. And they'll have their favorite Bible passage and so on. Um, but yet it's okay to threaten a journalist or go after a journalist in that way. Um, that is, that is a very serious and complicated problem that we have in the United States because you, know, you can have the midterms and the Democrats can take over the House and that's now a check on Trump or you can have 2020 and, and maybe Trump loses and somebody else becomes president. We still have this massive you know, residual effect of people who have been so poisoned, their minds have been so poisoned and twisted to think that journalists are out there trying to, you know, um, sell an agenda that, that has nothing to do with the news, um, that, we're, that we're outwardly just trying to deceive the American people. Um, that, is, that is a very serious problem that's going to take a lot of time to, to deal with. And I think that that is one of the sad realities, sad and depressing realities of what, I, what we do right now is that it's, it's all, I don't want to call it deprogramming because it sounds like we've all been in a cult or something, but there are some people who are, over time, going to see the errors of their ways. And it's, I, the, the way I compare it is I compare it to when you look at those pictures from the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s and you see white young men screaming at a black patron at, at a lunch counter in Alabama. At the time, that young person thought that was a perfectly fine thing to do. And then you go back and you see some of these documentaries, you see some of these specials about the Civil Rights Movement, and they'll find somebody who was that person yelling at that kid, and they, how terrible they feel about themselves. And, you know, not, not, to, not to, it might be a little bit of apples and oranges to, to draw this analogy, but I'll tell you that, you know, I was at a rally in Tampa last summer, and you probably saw some of this video of all these people screaming at me and yelling at me and it went, went around the world on YouTube and so on. And people were giving me the middle finger and everything. And, and there was one elderly man in the crowd who was giving me the middle finger. He came up to me at a rally right before the midterms and apologized. And he said, and I put that clip on my Instagram account and, and he, comes, he, go, he came up to me and he goes, he goes, I just wanted to apologize to you for giving you the middle finger at that rally in Tampa. <laughs> And I said, wait a minute, I gotta get my phone out. I said, can I, can I get this on video? And he goes, yeah, sure. And I started rolling, I said, go ahead, sir. He goes, he goes I just wanna apologize for giving that middle finger to you in and, and Tampa, and his wife was right there, and she was like, yeah, he apologizes, he apologizes. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, yes. Not because it was video gold, but because it, it was, but, um, but because it said to me that you can get caught up in the heat of the moment but as time goes on, and maybe you, you, you see somebody that you didn't like, and you, you find out, oh, maybe he's not so bad after all, and so on, that attitudes can change. And it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen as fast as people in Europe who are freaked out about the United States uh, would like to see it happen. You know, because I come over here, and I, and I talk to my friends in the foreign press, or I'll, I'll be in a, a pub or whatever, and, you know, so a Brit will come up to me and they'll be like, what's going on with you guys? You're out of control. You know, and that sort of thing. This is crazy. And I'm like, 
you're telling me I'm in the middle of this thing, man. And, you know, um, it's sort of like that, was I, how nerdy was it of me to reference Winston Churchill earlier? I'm sure you guys were like, oh my God, another American talking about Churchill. Blah. But, you know, he used to say Americans, um, they finally get around to doing the right thing after exhausting all options or something along those lines. <laughs> That's one of his famous lines. And I think that, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. You know, we're still a young country. You know, we're, maybe we're a little bit like that, uh, that adolescent uh, retriever that, you know, he's, he's learned to go outside, but he's not quite there yet, you know. Um, uh, we still have big messes over in the U.S. from time to time, and, you know, it might take a little while to clean up this one. We're just about out of time, but I think that's a really nice note to end it on. So, Jim, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you time. very much. Appreciate it.